It's not often you hear anyone say people had it easier in the old days. But there is one group for whom perhaps things have got a bit harder, especially in the United States. And they are passenger railway pioneers. In 1800s, it took four days to travel from New York to Washington DC and two weeks to reach Georgia or Ohio in a fastest steam locomotive train. About 30 years later, train travel in the US was almost twice as fast, which is a huge improvement. Rather than taking two weeks going to Georgia or Ohio from New York, it took one week. And in two, it could get to the state borders of Louisiana, Arkansas, and Illinois. And getting to Minnesota would have taken about five weeks. By 1857, with a week's travel, you could get to the eastern border of Texas. And in about four weeks, you could get to California. Only the Northwest took a longer than a month to reach from New York. By 1930, it took two days to get across half the United States by train, and three to four days to get to the other coast. And now in 2019, after almost a century later, it takes almost three days to reach California from New York in an old noisy Amtrak trains, which is a for-profit, government-subsidized passenger rail company. Sure, there are airlines that could take a lot more faster now. Regardless, on the other side of the globe, China has the world's fastest and largest high-speed rail network of more than 30,577 kilometers, the vast majority of which was built in the past decade. For example, Amtrak's fastest line, Acela Express, with its average speed of 104 kilometers per hour, takes from Washington DC to Boston in seven hours. And China's Shanghai Maglev, can travel the same distance from Beijing to Zhengzhou in 2 hours and 20 minutes, with its average speed of 300 km per hour. Even Japan's 60-year-old Shinkansen trains can travel at an average speed of 200 km per hour and can take passengers from Washington to Boston in 3 hours and 30 minutes. Not only China and Japan, but most of Europe, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and even economically small countries like Uzbekistan have high-speed rail system. But why the wealthiest country in the world, the United States of America, hasn't adopted or even developing a high-speed rail system? The first problem of America with high-speed rail is the population density problem. When you fly across the United States, look down on a non-cloudy day, and you will quickly realize how empty and different it is compared to when you fly across most Asian and European countries. For example, this is the population density of China and its high-speed rail system. And this is Europe and the US. And even denser cities are more suburban sprawl than the concentrated type of urban living you see in Asia and Europe. For instance, Dallas is the fourth largest metropolitan area has a lower population density than Hebei province. And Hebei is not even considered a particularly dense Chinese province. This is probably the largest single factor making the economics of high-speed rail system in the US very difficult. The second problem is property rights. One of the most expensive parts of building new rail lines these days is securing land along a relatively straight path. For truly high-speed rail, you need a long straightaway with few curves or inclines. That means it's very important to lay the rail in the best possible path. Trying to do this between, say, New York and Chicago would be an approximately a century of court battles with homeowners, environmental groups, and other agencies. The US has strong property rights which makes securing land exceedingly expensive. Back when it was cheap to secure land, the US had no problem building the tracks across the country. In comparison, in China, the land is still largely controlled by the state, which makes it much easier to secure. To give you the perspective, in China, it costs between 17 and 21 million dollars per kilometer to build the tracks, including land acquisition, resettlement, civil works costs, labor costs, stations, well, including everything. In Europe, it costs between 25 and 39 million dollars per kilometer, obviously because of the higher labor costs and higher land acquisitions to build the tracks. And for example, in the United States, high-speed rail construction in California, connecting Anaheim and San Francisco, costing up to staggering 150 million dollars per kilometer and averaging at around 56 million dollars, mainly because of land acquisition, holdouts, people leveraging their property rights and lawsuits. The construction had been going on for nearly five years now, and it needs another $45 billion to finish the project. Because of these high costs, the construction of high-speed rail in California had been postponed indefinitely. The third problem is culture. In 1956, Dwight Eisenhower signed the Interstate Highway System Act, 
A network of controlled access highways that forms part of the national highway system consequently pumping already growing American car culture. Between 1950 to 1958, 67 million cars were registered in the United States alone. Federal government and media heavily promoted the idea of countrywide travel in a car, boosting inner tourism and showing people the benefits of newly introduced interstate highways. But with the growth of the highway system, trains quickly became the more cumbersome form of transportation. Whereas trains had to leave from a particular place at a particular time, cars moved at the whim of the traveler. Between 1950 and 1970, railroad passenger traffic declined by more than half. The automobile deeply ingrained into the core fabric of the American culture. In 2007, the public sector spent $146 billion to build, operate, and maintain highways in the United States. These huge investments into the interstate highway system also reinforced the critical role of the automobile in American culture. Much of the suburban sprawl development of cities and towns is a direct offshoot of this massive investment. The fourth problem is mismanagement of network effects. Another important facet of high-speed rail is the value of network effects. It's a far more attractive proposition to build a high-speed rail system that looks more like a web instead of a point-to-point -point line. This is because webs tend to result in much higher utilization than point-to-point -point systems. And utilization is the most important determinant behind the economics of high fixed cost businesses like high speed rail. For example, this is the high speed passenger rail map of Europe. One tangled and messy spider web. And you can get from Moscow to London via train. Generally, this strongly connected network effect is surely one contributor to the more favorable economics behind high speed rail in Europe. And now let's look at China. This is a pretty intricate web of cities and once again supports the economics behind high-speed rail. Now you will notice the one extending out across the hinterlands to Urumqi. This line operates at a loss and built purely for political reasons. There had been uprisings and separatist movements in Western China because Western China is inherently where Uyghurs live, ethnically Turkic people completely different from Han Chinese. This high-speed rail line has been built as a political gesture that China is united, so are all the nations in it, creating this network effect. Let's look at the passenger railway network of the United States. Much less web-like for sure. Even in states like Wyoming, South Dakota do not have a passenger rail system. It's nearly impossible for high-speed railroads, especially in the middle of the country, that can sustain the minimum economics needed to justify the tens of billions of dollars per year necessary to upkeep and operating costs. The densest regions of the United States are located along the eastern seaboard. Running a single line from Boston down through New York and onto Washington DC makes the most economic sense. Indeed, this is where Amtrak's fastest train, Acela Express, exists as well as most utilized regular passenger rail lines. However, one of the limiting factors behind the economics of passenger rail in the United States is simply it cannot take advantage of nationwide network effects conveyed by web-like networks you see in Europe and China. American passenger trains might suck big time, but America has by far the largest rail network in the world, with more than twice as much track as China. Instead of passengers, most of America's massive rail network is used to carry freight. The US rail system today is primarily used for long-haul shipping of bulk of goods that are not as time-sensitive, and that will be coal, crude oil, and timber. Moving goods by rail is four times more fuel efficient than by road and it's very cheap, particularly in the US. It costs 2.5 cents per kilometer to move one ton worth of goods. Private rail companies build and own railways, and they have invested about 17% of their revenues in their networks since 90s. This is about half a trillion dollars of private money over the past three decades. For example, this is the passenger railroad that crosses North Dakota, and this is the freight network that crosses the same state. In Europe, freight companies pay passenger rail companies to use their railroad. In the US, it's vice versa. Passenger carriers like Amtrak pay freight companies to use their railroads and given low priority pass, making delays more problematic and causing higher ticket fees. 
Besides, there must be only one major country in the world that bribery is legal. And that country is, of course, the United States of America. That legal bribery goes by name of lobbying and special interests. Basically, corporations giving money to politicians, so politicians make laws that benefit corporations. For example, Amazon, Netflix, and other giant companies paid zero federal taxes in 2018 because those corporations have successfully lobbied lawmakers, giving them money for their own benefits. It's basically corporations running the country. So the biggest enemy of high-speed rail in the United States is lobbying. In the front lines are airlines. The airline industry is understandably terrified that high-speed rail might cut into their market share. And of course it would. The airline industry pours millions of dollars into lobbying against high-speed rail, trying to ensure that tracks never get built. This hostility has become particularly evident in Texas, as the state attempts to build a 322-kilometer-per-hour high-speed rail line between Dallas and Houston have been smashed by aggressive attacks and lobbying by Southwest Airlines. The airline went so far as to threaten to leave the state of Texas entirely. Bigger industries like the oil companies pour billions of dollars into lobbying, propaganda, and paid politicians. And other infrastructures like the interstate highway system has this vast ecosystem of vendors whether they are asphalt suppliers, road construction companies, underground construction companies, paving and repaving companies. Basically, high-speed rail is an existential threat to oil, airline, and road industries as it does not use any fossil fuel and completely eco-friendly. And this lobbying problem will not go away easily. There is one more interesting analysis why the high-speed rail is being divided among developed countries, and that is oil production. Countries like China, Japan, France, South Korea, Spain, and Germany, all notable for high investments in high-speed rail, and still have relatively good car culture with high-volume car manufacturing, but have minimal oil resources. The US has the lowest high-speed rail investment intensity and not coincidentally has one of the highest amounts of oil reserves and the biggest producer of oil in the world. Despite all the hurdles, I personally think at the very least, intercity high-speed rail in metropolitan areas like in Texas, California, Florida, and in northeastern states is something must be done. Population density problem can be solved due to how long does it take to build this train system as the population keeps growing. Property rights can be solved as the freight companies have already done it. As per property rights cost, the US doesn't hesitate to spend $750 billion per single year on the military spending. With this annual spending on the military, the entire nationwide high-speed rail infrastructure can be built or maybe two years of this sum at the max. But the lack of will and political enmity towards high-speed trains, it will be kept on hold. But I think after 20 or 30 years, climate change will push people into switching to more eco-friendly means of transport. So high-speed rail in the United States is probably inevitable in the future. Thanks for watching. What do you think? Does high-speed rail work in the US? Leave your thoughts down in the comment section below and support this channel on Patreon. It will help to increase the quality in the video production. I have some videos coming up and we will continue our series on the insane alternatives to get to space. If you like the videos, please hit the like button and subscribe.